Yeah, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of PLA with myself, uh, Nick, and Bruno. And we've got three questions today. We'll be doing the first two, um, one by one after, well, one by one or individually with Nick, and then we'll do the third one then uh, with Bruno. Um, so the first one, Nick, deals basically with the agent um, asking whether they can advise uh, tenants to hold back rent until um, an electricity um, account is basically handled uh, accordingly with the municipality. And it reads as follows that a, a tenant took occupation in January 2024, which is this year, of a unit in a block of flats with a prepaid electrical meter still needing to be installed. Uh, the municipality has cut the electricity to the unit and she is tomorrow now without uh, a week without electricity. The landlord is to sort out the account still with them, which they are still currently busy with. Uh, can we, uh, as the agents, hold the rental back and suggest to the tenant that they then go ahead and place the landlord on terms? Nick? So it's an interesting uh, interesting um, question because uh, one assumes that if, if there is an agent involved in this particular circumstance, the agent is acting on behalf of the landlord. So I'd be very careful if I was the agent who's writing it. But, but notwithstanding, uh, I also want to be careful about suggesting that anyone holds back rental, okay? Mostly because we don't have the agreement that's actually entered into between the parties and most lease agreements, good lease agreements that are in the industry, um, specifically exclude the uh, a party's ability to withhold performance of payments of rental. Um, and so any suggestion of doing something like that may end you up in a situation where there's a breach of the contract and a problem, okay? Um, that being said, rental is a specific charge that is uh, charged in terms of a lease agreement and it's a specific thing in law, okay? It is a, a, a remuneration that is given for the free use and enjoyment of a particular thing, okay? And in the case of uh, property rentals, electricity um, is, is part of the free use and enjoyment of that particular thing, okay? So... When there's no electricity and it's as a result of the landlord not actually settling the accounts in a particular circumstances, that right to freely use and enjoy a particular property may be infringed upon as a result of the landlord's failure in the circumstances. Okay. And that is a breach of the lease agreement. Okay. The primary thing you have to do as a landlord, your primary obligation is to give that free use and enjoyment. And if you are preventing the tenant from using that property properly, um, you're in breach. Okay, so the as to the question, would I suggest that you withhold payment of rental? No, um, that might get the uh, uh, might exacerbate the circumstances, or certainly will exacerbate the circumstances, but may create a breach on behalf of the party that it seems, given the facts that we've got in front of us, is not actually in breach at this point. I'm making the assumption that the tenants is fully paid up and they've paid their electricity charges, et cetera. And this is just a, a landlord problem not having settled with the, the municipality. You don't want to put the tenants into a position where they're now they're also in breach of the contract. So no, I wouldn't suggest withholding the rental. Okay. That needs to be paid. Is there a, an ability for the tenant to say, look, I am entitled to remission in that rental because I haven't had free use and enjoyment of that property for a week? Yes. Is a perfectly good argument for that, um, and there's a, a very good argument that, um, as the writer said at the very end of the question, you can place the landlord on terms. Absolutely, that's also a, a possibility, but I'm afraid without the contract in front of me, uh, I would say stay safe. Don't don't withhold rental if you if you don't absolutely know you've got a right to do so, which is written into that particular contract. Uh, that would be the only circumstances where I'd suggest something like that happens, but. Absolutely, go ahead, put place the landlord on terms in the circumstances. It seems that there is a breach if if they've been failing to pay the municipality and the electricity has been turned off as a result. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, th thank you very much, Nick. Uh, nice and straightforward to that one. And then we'll deal with the second question there with uh, once again with you, Nick. Uh, this one is more of a levies uh, a levies dispute. Uh, so there are being there are costs that are being passed on to the tenant. Uh, which were not stipulated on the lease agreement, and uh, these are just extra costs, such as parking and sewage. Uh, but the question goes as follows: 
we all understand uh, the reader uh, that levies are not usually passed on uh, to uh, on, onto the tenant um, unless usage of water etc can then be shown uh, they have the lease in place they say nick uh, in a fairly new development the lease agreement only stipulated that prepaid electricity of is for the tenant's account however the levy statements received from the landlord tabulate a usage of extra things such as sewage parking and heating pumps uh, which the tenant refuses to pay as this was not stipulated in in the lease that they speak of um, then the question uh, then um, raises that um, the landlord states that still the the the, the tenant is liable to pay these um, and then uh, the, 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 our reader goes on to, or our viewer says, it's getting extremely uh, bitter at this point and we would like to resolve this. Nick? Perfect. So this is another example of why it's very important to get a, a good lease agreement in place, have a good lease agreement and get advice if you really need to with regards to your tenants. So um, you as a landlord are entitled to pass on particular charges to your tenant while they're using the premises okay so rental is the remuneration payable by the tenant to the landlord for the use and enjoyment of the premises okay and then you can agree that other certain other charges are passed on to your tenant in the circumstances okay that would normally include your water your electricity sewerage um etc okay but those charges are not necessarily for the tenant's account by virtue of the fact that a lease agreement is in place. These are specific things that you have to agree uh, are payable over and above your rental. OK, and the idea is basically at a very fundamental level, you can agree to rent out a property and say you accept a, a rental amount whatever 10,000 rand it can be a, it can be agreed that your electricity water is actually going to come out of that 10,000 rand use and enjoyment it's got to be specifically agreed that you're going to take the rental amount and then the other charges okay are on top of the particular rental amount so uh, in a case like this where the lease agreement only stipulates a prepaid electricity amount that is what you're going to be entitled you cannot simply add on additional charges because you believe that they belong to the tenant but it's not stipulated within the lease agreement in particular something like in this case there's a, a parking charge that has now been levied onto the tenant's account now that's not necessarily utility that is if anything another rental charge because you're allowing them the use and enjoyment of a particular parking space in the circumstances. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, if um, if this is a circumstance where the lease agreement is silent on the additional charges, and remember, you know, the, if the lease says something like utilities, there's, there's an argument about what exactly that refers to. But if the lease agreement only says prepaid electricity and doesn't mention water, sewerage, the additional parking, then I'm afraid that is what is enforceable in the circumstances. You're only going to be able to get your electricity um, and the other charges. The tenant has every right to say, no, I never agreed to pay these charges over and above the rental amount that I am paying. Um, so once again, a, a, another great example. You, please, everyone have a look at your lease agreements, make sure they're up to date and, and they say exactly what you need. Yeah, absolutely. I can't stress it enough there once again. I thank you, Nick. And then, uh, Bruno, this brings us to the third question uh, today. Uh, dealing basically with uh, setting up companies and property companies, uh, so to speak. Um, obviously, when one is setting these up, uh, they might, well, it's very important that they, that they look at the amount of power that they have and when they can exercise the power, uh, what sort of rights they have and when they become applicable and when they can enforce those rights as well in terms of control. Uh, decision making and obviously security as well on their half. I mean, you you have uh, recently dealt with a matter uh, where uh, as a, a party they needed information uh, dis uh, disclosed to them, uh, right? Uh, there is a bit of a dispute. Uh, one did stand true to ship, but as it stands right now, he did pay for the property, and also they're trying to force the sale of the property out of the company, even though. Uh, they're not a shareholder. Maybe just give us a bit of background and then context and then provide an answer as to what one can do just uh, as the steps uh, before going into that and obviously once they're in this type of matter. Bruno? Cool. So 
partnering together when purchasing property is something that very, very, very often happens in South Africa. Um, the reason for this is it might be the lack of affordability, um, maybe co-contributions when it comes uh, comes to cash. And we normally refer to these as JV. Uh, one, one perfect example of when this happens, and again, it happens very often, and this happens with business partners, couples alike, one person approaches the bank in their name and the bank does an assessment on their affordability and grants a loan again in favor of this person with this person signing a surety ship, leaving the other person who may be contributed all the cash with very little rights because this has not been documented properly. And this is a big risk in South Africa nowadays. The context in this particular case was very much that uh, the one person to, would not uh, would not qualify for a bond in South Africa, um, so they asked somebody else to stand in for them. They contributed most of the cash. In fact, it was a cash uh, transaction where half of the purchase price was actually contributed, um, and the other person in at that moment in in kindness, I'm assuming. Um, approached the bank and created a company. And in this company, it was the sole shareholder, sole director, and the bank afforded uh, him or that company a loan and mortgaged the property um, in security of that loan. As it stands at the moment, though, um, this person, this partner, is the only shareholder, only director, meaning that they have full control over that company. And there was there was no document that actually gave the sh the main person, our client, the investor, the person that put in the money. There's no document that gave this person any rights. Now, where this becomes a massive issue is obviously when there's a fallout between the two partners. And it's one of my main reasons to emphasize the focus when it comes to business relationships and commercial relationships, the proper documentation be put in place that uh, governs the relationship between two parties. Because once the relationship deteriorates and you're counting entirely on good faith, once it deteriorates and the good faith dissipates, then what do you have left? Nothing. You need a set of rules. And that's the only real way to govern relationships worldwide is by having a set of rules that people respect and that people acknowledge exist. In this particular instance, two situations arose. The first one was the disclosure of information. Uh, amounts being paid towards the bank and how the banks did certain calculations and the communication with the banks and decisions that were made throughout the home loan period were not made available to the investor. So the investor was completely in the dark as to how uh, repayments were being calculated, how the loan term wasn't exactly what they had anticipated it to be, and they weren't able to get the answers, unfortunately, from the partner due to the deterioration relationship. Second issue is obviously now taking back the property. At the end of the day, the implied agreement between the parties was that the one putting in the money was actually buying the property. The other one was doing a favor. And by doing a favor, was he entitled to a portion of the property? In this instance, the investor believes not. But since it's not documented, now the forceful, call it the forceful return of the shares uh, in the way that the investor had anticipated it taking place um, needs to that needs to find itself some sort of recourse to enforce that. And what is that recourse? Since it's not documented, it's a question of possibly going to court and trying to convince the court that the commercial terms of the agreement that the investor is reliant upon actually make sense. Um, and since there's always two versions to the story, this does carry a level of risk to it. So I think the... Uh, the takeaway from the story is never underestimate, never overestimate trust and never underestimate something in writing. It doesn't have to be attorney based. It could be in an email, just setting out certain basics of what you believe 
uh, the relationship to entail and what you believe the final outcome to entail. But when entering into any sort of commercial arrangement, especially regarding an asset as valuable as property, that's also passive, that doesn't necessarily always require active management. When entering into a transaction relating to this, it is crucial that the disposal of that asset or that the future of that asset be very, very clearly addressed. Who does it actually belong to? When can it be sold? When can one person get access to it? And the disclosure of information, because if one person stands as director and shareholder, the problem is that Financial institutions like banks, for example, will only recognize that person. So as great as your agreement may be, um, unless you go and you try and enforce it in the court and get a court order, um, that, that specific financial institution is not authorized to disclose any private information to you. So be very careful how you structure this. Be very careful to make sure that you've got the right rights in place in order to be able to request information if necessary. Uh, thank you very much, uh, there, Bruno. Um, a nice, uh, broad, and yet uh, straight to the point um, sort of guideline on how these uh, sort of agreements and joint ventures uh, one should set up. Um, obviously, within property, uh, it, 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 it just comes with uh, the practice that you're going to enter into partnerships, you're going to enter into joint ventures to grow your portfolio. Uh, but what's more important is that, uh, that the agreement that actually binds uh, all the parties together in those terms and conditions. And just understanding them in how they what they mean in the long run, in the short run, and in the long run. And that does bring us to the end of uh, today's uh, three questions and uh, answers. And we'll see everybody again next week. Thank you once again. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.